Okay. Uh, for starters, a couple of announcements. Um, one, you saw me uh, post about this on uh, Slack, and you should have also got an email uh, uh, email from me about CU Launch, which the, the first of three session, <laughs> sessions is, um, what is it, a week from today? I think it's a week from today, the 24th. Um, it's going to be in the same place where our tech talks are. Um, you should go to that. Uh, you So if you haven't heard of these things before, they're called uh, uh, business incubators. And uh, so there's incubators and accelerators. So an incubator says, we're going to teach you how to take an idea and turn it into a business model. And, you know, because ideas are a dime a dozen. All of us have probably sat around and thought, oh, there should be an app for this. You know, or, you know, why isn't there an automated way of, of getting this? You know, just different things like that. Um, and what CU Launch does is it lets you come in, you can have an idea, it could be a stupid idea. It could be a useless idea. It could just be an idea that you're trying to learn from that doesn't even make sense. We could take the idea from the uh, uh, from Mike, the speaker at our last tech talk, where you're maybe proposing a food truck for sea cucumber uh, in the Mequon area and go through the process of determining whether this idea is good, how do you make money off of it, all, all of this stuff free pizza and drinks, they're going to teach you the process of kind of entrepreneurship. So the idea of starting your own business, starting your own company, this this type of thing, um, which so many people are doing in the tech world now. Uh, and people pay thousands of dollars for this education. You get it for free, plus they're going to feed you. Um, it's a great deal. And there's prizes, money prizes. So they're this year they're dedicating $5,000 in prize money to uh, just the IT track. So people who come up with software ideas, you don't have to implement it. All it is is, hey, I think it would be a cool idea if there was an app for getting my coffee filled by student slave labor. For example, where I put out maybe a request that Littman's coffee cup is empty. And then I can have a you know group of individuals who are willing to fill said coffee cup that would get effectively Littman's bat signal, signal right? And it would pop up on their phone and just annoy you every like five seconds. And then you have to like accept the request, right? And <laughs> Littman, um, so funny idea, but I mean, it could be something like that. You know, and then you would go through this whole canvassing, pro canvassing process that they're going to teach you about where they put, give, put you on this big piece of paper and, you know, up here you write like, you know, um, who are your users, who are uh, the, 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 the other people that aren't your users that are part of your solution. So like for me, it would be like Sodexo and stuff like that, that, you know, they need to have coffee in order for this whole thing to happen. And. Uh, and all this stuff. They give you a free book called The Mom Test, which is a really good entrepreneurial book. Um, so many people who come up with ideas and try to uh, generate businesses off things, they go and talk to people. They say, hey, if this app existed, would you use it? And that those are like, this, this book teaches you that those are like the wrong questions to ask. So they try to train you on uh, like, talk to people as if they were your mom that you're having this discussion with about this stuff. Uh, the last three years of CU, like last year in CU Launch, um, Maddie Martins and uh, Grace Coaster, they won uh, CU Launch, got 2500 bucks. Um, they had planned to start the business from it. You, if you went to the senior seminar presentations last year, they were the, the one that was the HP, HBU mental health app thing. That's the thing that won CU Launch, but they didn't have any implementation at the time. It was just the idea. And they said, this is how we can make money. This is who is going to pay us. This is who our users are. Users were like students at universities. They were going to get money from the universities that themselves who wanted to help the students. And then they designed a business model around it. Good experience. They got 2500 bucks. They had decided that they were going to start the business off of that. Then they both went and got good jobs right out of school, dissolved the company, each walked with a grand. All for getting free pizza and soda and showing up to three sessions. Not a bad gig, right? Lots of experience, lots of education, show up. Okay, it's next uh, Tuesday, the 24th from 5 p.m. Uh, until 8 p.m. It's over in that same area where our tech talks are. 
Um, if you're going to be a little late, that's okay. Um, try to be on time, but if you're going to be a little late, that's that's okay because usually that first hour or so is eating, maybe them giving you the initial kind of pitch idea. They don't actually break into those groups of, you know, having mentors walk around helping you make out your canvases and, and things like that um, until probably, you know, hour or two or, or something like that. Um, if you don't have an idea, that's fine. Just show up. They're going to go around the table and anybody who does have an idea, they can share those ideas and maybe that gets your you know, intellectual juices flowing. Or maybe somebody else is there, has an idea and they don't have a team. And they say, hey, I need some help. Join me. And you go and join that team. What's up? Is it three consecutive weeks? No. Um, they're actually spread out quite a bit. So it's uh, the first, usually they don't announce all the weeks until, they might have the next two weeks announced next Tuesday, but Typically, it's um, this first week, and then it's probably about a month later, okay. something like that. And then the last event is the pitch pitch event where you show up, you give like a you know a, a ten minute pitch, might even be a five minute pitch in front of like a group of judges. Sometimes I've been the judge, well, I've been one of the judges. Sometimes I, I'm I don't do that. Um, but then you know there's a deliberation period when they come out and they say, okay, who's good and who sucks. Um, and historically, depending on participation, there was a year where the top prize was five thousand dollars, and there was only four groups that participated. So they just gave the other they gave the top prize five thousand. They gave each of the other three groups the runners up a grant, just for participating. You know, I don't know. That's what they'll do this year. We're trying to get a lot more, you know, a lot more people involved. But the worst case is you get food and education, and five grand isn't that much money. It might seem like a lot to some of you. But it's not that much money. When you come up with a good a good idea, and you start getting investors in these things, money like real money is like a hundred or two hundred thousand uh, dollars that you can use then to pay yourself and to incubate your idea and stuff like that. And sometimes good ideas come out of incubators, and then there are other things called accelerators that you can join, and they'll take a cut of your company, but they will give you all the tools and. Um, you know, lawyers and things like that that you need to accelerate your company from an idea to a reality so that as the, you know, people who are passionate about the idea, you can focus on making your idea a reality rather than all of this stuff that you don't know, don't know anything about. Forming an LLC, talking to lawyers, getting intellectual property protected, all sorts of stuff like that. Not your cup of tea, give away 20% of your company, who cares? Go and make it real. You'd rather have 80% of a lot than 100% of nothing. Make sense? But these are cool things and in the world of technology today, um, people create businesses in their basement. And so many of our history lessons, Apple started in a garage, Hewlett Packard started in a garage. You know, these are old fogey businesses now. You know, every, Uber started with just a couple of people doing it. Google was just two guys working on their PhD at Stanford who dropped out of school so that Stanford didn't own Google. It was their dissertation. Because they, if they had gone too far, Stanford would have owned the intellectual property. So they dropped out of their doctoral <laughs> program and decided to go start a small company. You know, these are, you know, what has happened in the past. It doesn't mean let money drive your passion for it, but hey, you can make a couple of bucks, help pay your tuition, whatever. So I would strongly encourage you to set aside next Tuesday, 5 p.m. until 8 p.m. and at least go to the first thing. If you end up hating it, you just can't commit and decide it's just not your cup of tea, then don't go to the other two. That's fine, but give it a shot. You know, and I'm not going to require it because I shouldn't have to bribe you to go and win money. It's kind of a stupid thing, but you know, whatever. All right, questions about CU Launch. All right, if you are going to go to it, do me a favor and uh, message me on Slack so I can uh, kind of get a rough head count so I can make sure we have enough food and things like that for it. Um, let's see. Next thing is the Hackathon Club. Uh, they're trying to get uh, their travel arrangements in order. They're going to a hackathon in Champaign, Illinois next Friday. So not this week, but next week, you know, uh, um, was it the 28th, 29th? I think those are the dates, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, so it's next Friday. It is, uh, Champaign, Illinois. It's called Pig Hack. It's put on by a company called, uh, 
well, one of the main sponsors is Wolfram Research. They're the makers of a piece of software called Mathematica. And um, lots of good free prizes, lots of free food, but it's our traditional hackathon. You go there, um, you know, the hackathon team's gonna split into, you know, two, three, four teams, however many people they can get to go. You work on some, you know, project that's probably related to either last year, I think it was, you had to do something that benefited the University of Illinois, you know, like some sort of app that was geared towards students at the University of Illinois. 24 hours, get a lot of experience. Maybe you win some money, maybe you don't. Uh, last year we took second. Uh, the year before that, I think we won. Um, I don't think there was actually money. I think they won Xboxes, something like that. Um, it was weird though, like they, they got, the team got an Xbox. <laughs> so then they had to like figure out how to fight over it or something. But I mean, it, the, the prizes are insignificant. I mean, I just can't emphasize enough how much these extra experiences will benefit you. It's talk to any of these students that have come out of Concordia and gone and you know, gotten jobs for 70 grand a year at Acuity or Northwestern Mutual and every single one of them will tell you we went to all these hackathons, we competed in CU Launch, we did all this stuff that was outside of the classroom. And while it might seem inconvenient for your schedule, so much of the learning that takes place when you're in college is outside of the classroom. Take advantage of it, you know, I don't know swap shifts with somebody at Chancery or something like that. <laughs> You know, I get it, I get it, sometimes real life gets in the way, but do as many of these things as you can because they're free. And they're gonna pay dividends so much later on. Um, so, if you are interested in participating in a hackathon, they're trying to arrange uh, travel at this point for like, you know, carpooling and things like that. So, uh, get with uh, Josh Appel, A-P-P-E-L on Slack. Um, uh, if you want, you can also private message me and I can uh, make sure your name gets put on the list. Uh, but that's next Friday. I think they're leaving around noon on Friday and they're coming back Saturday night. Um, good experience, doesn't matter how good of a coder you think you are. If you're a complete beginner and don't think you can contribute at all, you're exactly who they're looking for. Because you're gonna go now and you're gonna learn a lot and next year, the year after that, you're gonna be one of the team leads. This is how learning occurs. All right, so don't be, don't think you suck and not participate. Do yeah. they do multiple in the year? Oh yeah. Okay. But this is the next one coming up. Okay. Yeah. One thing we've noticed over the last several years is some of the big hackathons are, haven't been as consistent. So we typically do one in Madison, um, but we used to go to New York City every year, Chicago, Raleigh, Durham. Um, we went to Los Angeles a couple of times, and those haven't been advertised the last several years. So I would take advantage of anyone that you can possibly take advantage of. All right. I think that is all of the special announcements. Any other questions about any of that stuff? All right. So what was the homework assignment? Was it convert something to something? What was I converting? Uh, oh, is this it? No, this isn't it. Any base both ways. This is us. Ah, so you're supposed to do decimal to base? And then also base to decimal? It looks like we wrote, oh, we, we started base to decimal. So base to decimal, took in a base, and I started writing it. I told you this will work for, well, it actually currently only works for base two, right. as I have it written, but it's the starting point for working for any base. All right, so let's go ahead and write this one first. So base to decimal is going to take in a string representation of a number in some base, and then we're going to advertise what base that number is in so that we can do the conversion. All right, so our challenge here is when we wrote this for binary, we only had two possible options for each bucket of our string. We were either looking at a zero or we were looking at a one. Well, if I had passed in an octal number, a base eight number, I'm looking at a zero, a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, or a seven. Base 10 number, zero to nine. Base 16 number, zero to nine, A through F. 
so on and so forth. So I need to be able to convert within my alphabet to uh, uh, these things. So what we're gonna do, we can do it in line here, but I'm actually gonna give myself a little helper function. So I'm gonna do static int char to int, something like that. This guy will take a char c as a parameter. And I think I showed you a couple of functions last time. We talked about what, index of, I think? All right, so and I gave you a hint that index of might be very helpful for this. And I also think I said char at might be helpful for the other one. So there's two kind of power tools that we can use. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just create a string called map and I'm gonna do zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I'll say a, b. So just give me the whole alphabet uh, there. So now if the character I passed in was a one, I want to spit out the number one. If the character I passed in was an A, I want to spit out a 10. That make sense? Those are, that's the examples of an input, an input of the char one, and here's the desired output. I'm returning an int, I'm taking a char. Now, if I look at this string, I find the char one at position one in that string. I find the char A at position 10 in that string. So what I'll do here is I'll return map.index of C. So index of returns the position where this character, whatever that character holds, is first found in the calling string. So the first place that we find a one is at position one. The first place we find an A is at position 10. The first place we find an F is at position 15. That makes sense? All right. I'll also, just since we're here, I'll go ahead and give myself a um, int to char function. I'll give myself that exact same starter string. And in this case, if I took in a 10, I want it to return an A. So a 10 should give me an A. A, I'm sorry, this is like this. 10 should give me an A. A one should give me a one. Understand what this guy's doing? All right, so how do I accomplish this one? I return map.charat i. If I say map, give me whatever lives at bucket one, it will give me the char one. Map, give me whatever lives at bucket 10, it will give me the char a. Map, give me whatever lives at the bucket 15, it'll give me a char f. Make sense? So these two functions will help us map between integers and chars for our various bases, all right? So both of these are pretty simple functions in and of themselves, aren't they? We ran out to Home Depot, got ourselves this little $2 tool that's gonna help us a whole lot in the little project we're about to work on. Okay, so for base to decimal, Rather than ask a question, is it a one, or is it a two, or is it a three, or is it a four? What we're gonna do is we're going to get the numeric version of the character we're looking at. Just steal this. So we're gonna set sum equal to sum plus place times, and then we're gonna say uh, um, char to 
int of s dot char at i. So I'm going to add on to my sum whatever place we're currently at. If we're dealing with binary, this is the 1's place, the 2's place, the 4's place, the 8's place, 16, so on and so forth. If we're dealing with base 16, it's the 1's place, the 16's place, the 256 place, so on and so forth. All right, so whatever the place is multiplied by the integer that is returned by calling my little function up there called char to int, passing it this character that we're currently looking at and having and expecting it to spit back the numeric of the numeric version of that. Now this works because what if I give it a zero? If I give it a zero, char to int on zero will give me the int zero. Correct? And place times zero will always be a what? Zero. So we're not breaking anything. Sum plus zero will always be whatever sum used to be. So this doesn't break one thing. So we'll always do the math. Sometimes we'll be multiplying by zero, possibly breaking or possibly not breaking it, but just maybe doing a little wasted math. Every single time we'll increment our place or we'll multiply our place by base to make it be the next placeholder. In the end, we'll return our sum. All right, so this is base to decimal. This other one, decimal to base, we're going to take a decimal number, we're going to divide it over and over and over again, recording the results, right? So remember, we keep dividing until we finally get a zero. While decimal is greater than zero. We're going to do some stuff. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to have an answer. So string answer will start off as the empty string. We're going to build this guy up. Now, remember, when we do this division and record the remainder, we actually read our answer from bottom up. So we can build it in reverse or we can reverse it at the end. I'm going to go ahead and build it in reverse. So we're going to say answer is equal to something concatenated with answer. That's what I'm going to do right here. Now, what is this something? Well, I'm going to do some math. I'm going to say decimal mod target base. All right. And this is going to give me a number. It'll give me a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4 or a 10 or an 11. Now, if it's a 10, I need it to be an A. If it's a 15, I need this guy to be an F. Okay, so I need to take that value there and I need to turn it into its character equivalent. So I'm going to call int to char of that number. Where's my int to char? Well, oh, lowercase c. In fact, actually, I don't like, I'm going to keep it in uppercase C. I'm going to rename it down here. This is typically, it's called camel case. It's kind of a naming convention for uh, um, writing functions where you start off with a lowercase and then you, you know, each syllable or something like that, you throw an uppercase letter in there. It's just for readability. It's not a rule or anything. So I'll call int to char on whatever decimal mod target base is. So this is going to give me that remainder of my division. But if I'm dealing with a large base, like base 16, my remainder might be something bigger than one character. It might be bigger than a 9. It could be a 10, which I actually want to be an A. It could be an 11, which I actually want to be a B. So on and so forth. Now, if it's a 1, that's okay. I want a 1 to be a 1, but char to int... I'm sorry, int to char, this guy right here, that'll work. If I pass it the int one, bucket one of this guy is the char one. Bucket 10 of this guy is the char A. Bucket 15 of this guy is the char F. 
So it will give me the character representation of whatever int I gave it. Okay, so I'm going to take whatever my answer currently is. I'm building up an answer in here. I'm going to set it equal to, since I'm going to build it in reverse, I'm going to go ahead and tack my answer onto the front of it. So my answer is going to be the char version of the remainder when I divide decimal by target base. So I'm going to convert, if that guy turns, into, turns out to be 10, I'll convert it to an A. If it turns out to be a 1, I'll convert it into the character 1. No harm, no foul. And then I'll concatenate that onto my running string answer. All right. Then after I've recorded that result, I'm going to say decimal is equal to decimal divided by target base. So I'll cut decimal down. And this does integer division. Remember in Python, if we wanted to force integer division, we did a double slash double slash in uh, Java and C and C++ and C sharp is a single line comment. So not going to fly, but the division operator in Java by default does integer division. So five divided by two would give us a two, not a 2.5. All right. So record the remainder as a character and then whittle down decimal. Keep doing this as long as decimal is greater than zero. As soon as it hits zero, we know we've completed whittling things down and we've recorded all of our remainders. So we'll return answer. Make sense? Yeah. All right, so we should be able to test these couple of things. Um, I'm going to just comment out uh, the scanner for a second so we can just test this. So we're going to call base to decimal. Um, we're going to pass it uh, my favorite hexadecimal number, BAD in 16. This should give us 2989. So there's our 2989. But this should also work on, is that a legal base 16 number? Sure, it's not a real interesting one, right? It's only using zeros and ones, but base 16 numbers allow you to use zero through nine, A through F. So I don't know what this number is gonna be, but I can tell you that's correct. <laughs> I have a lot of confidence in the code we wrote. All right, so, the, <laughs> so that is base to decimal. If I want to call decimal to base, And I want to give it 29.89 in hex, and I want to convert that to base 16. This should give me a BAD. And if it works for bad, it works for everything. So. All right. Questions about that? All right. So this was, is that the whole homework assignment? Yeah. All right. So how did this go? How did the assignment go? Uh, so let me give you. All right, so here, I'll just paste it in here. And this is decimal to base and base to decimal. All right. Um, so we've gotten, we've had a bunch of practice now with um, uh, strings, right? Now, kind of put this class in the context of what we did last semester. We did this exact function last semester, did we not? But we had to solve it slight. The algorithm was the same, wasn't it? As we did last year, but now we had to solve it in terms of index of and char at, so we're getting used to using some of these string functions. Okay, so do we feel pretty comfortable with uh, strings now? We could do some stuff with them, we're, we're experts in Java. 
All right, so good. So since everybody agrees with that, let's go ahead and uh, let's start working with uh, object-oriented things. So we'll expedite down the road. Uh, we'll go ahead and build something that we were used to building from uh, uh, before. Actually, you know what? Um, what would be an interesting, let's do this. I'm gonna say new class. So I'm adding to my projects. This is still in inside here. Right now I have a single class called driver.java, right? And that's gonna be the guy who drives my program. I'm gonna add another class to this because I wanna start using objects. I'm gonna start writing my own objects and then using those objects to do some stuff. All right, so I'm gonna right click here on the default package. I'm gonna say I want a new class. All right, and I'm gonna call this guy a fraction. All right. Did we do fractions last semester? I use that as one of our examples. How many of you guys memorized the entire previous class? I don't remember. Just garbage. We would I would have used it as an example of a time complexity problem. Does any of that ring a bell? No. All right, good. This will be fun. All right, so huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, then everybody take out a piece of paper. <laughs> All right, so we're going to create a class called fraction. Now, if I'm going to, if, let me just go ahead and just give you some context here from the, uh, the Python world. So Python world is we would do a, uh, what was it? Class fraction colon, then we'd indent, right? And then we had a underscore, underscore, init, underscore underscore and this guy would take in like a self and numerator and a denominator denominator something like that and then we would say something like self dot numerator is equal to numerator self dot denominator I can't spell that one. Denominator is equal to denom. <laughs> denominator. All right, something like that as our starting point. Okay, and this guy was called a constructor, right? Constructors construct objects. They initialize objects for us. Hence, this guy's name, init. Shorthand for initialize. Remember, Python used this like special syntax as underscore, underscore, some fancy word, underscore, underscore. That gave us like some built-in um, functionality. All right. So if we're going to do the equivalent of this in Java, we're going to have a class called Fraction. Now in Java, constructors use the same name as the class. So we're going to say public fraction int numerator int denominator. Like that. All right, so this is our constructor. Now, Java is a strongly typed language. So we can't just invent variables out of the blue. We had to predefine those variables. So inside of a class, we're gonna have a collection of fields. So I'm gonna have, for right now, I'm just gonna put, well, here, let's leave it like this. I'm gonna say int, numerator and I'm going to say int denominator so I'll define a couple of fields we're actually going to make a little change to this here in a few minutes but for right now we'll just leave it alone all right so fields these guys are variables associated with a class so self.numerator was a field self.denominator was a field numerator denominator these are both fields and i'm going to go ahead and give you the equivalent syntax down here i'm going to say this dot numerator is equal to numerator this dot denominator is equal to denominator in java instead of saying self dot Self in Python is how an object refers to itself from within itself. In Java, the equivalent to that is this. 
this, the this keyword is how an object refers to itself from within itself. Keyword that allows an object to refer to itself from within itself. All right, so this is already an idea we're familiar with. Okay, it's just called this in Java instead of self. It's also called this in C. Well, actually, it's not called this in C because C is a procedural language, doesn't have objects. It's called this in C++. It's called this in Java, called this in C Sharp. Um, it's called self in Swift. It's called self in Objective C. It's called me in Visual Basic. Yeah, I think that kind of covers the various things it's called. There might be another one out there, but it's usually this or self. Me doesn't count because that's a made up language that nobody should be using. All right. So we've created a simple fraction here, okay? Now I'm gonna go ahead and just give myself a public uh, function here uh, called display. And this guy is going to do a system.out.println. This.numerator concatenated with a little slash. Uh, should there be spaces or no spaces? Let's do no spaces concatenate with this dot denominator. All right, so a fraction keeps track of these pieces of information. We build it, passing it two pieces of information and having it set his internal thing equal to those pieces of information. And then we now have one ability called display. So that's gonna be it for my fraction class for right now. I'll come back out here to driver. I'm gonna go ahead and just get rid of all this junk down here. Clean everything up so it's a little bit. Uh... All right, so I'll go ahead and create a fraction. F1 is equal to a new fraction, one half. Fraction F2 is equal to a new fraction one fourth. Fraction F3 is equal to a new fraction three sixteenths, something like that. And then we'll say F1 dot display, F2 dot display, F3 dot display. So I'll construct myself three variables. So I have a variable F1, F2, F3. Each of these are of data type fraction that we just invented, right? <clears throat> we created this class called fraction. F1 is going to be a new fraction. That's my call to the constructor. I'm passing in a one and a two. One will come in for my numerator. Two will come in for my denominator. We will set our local fields equal to those two values. And then when we end up calling display, it will print out that particular fraction's numerator, followed by a front slash, followed by that particular fraction's denominator. So there's our three fractions calling their display methods. So now if I say system.out.println, F1, what will display? Memory address, why? So he's right, let's just look at crazy memory address. There's our crazy memory address. So why does this guy print out a memory address? Okay, so you're ahead of the game a little bit. Back up, pretend like you don't know what the two-string method is. 
based on what you see here, what's on the screen, why does this print out a memory address? What's the value of F1? What value did I give F1? What's this guy do? Yeah. So new is our real estate agent. This guy goes and finds new memory for us. So the value of F1 is going to be equal to a memory address. What memory address? The memory address where this constructor actually built that fraction. If I go ahead and print out the other ones, we'll see these are different memory addresses. So right here, this is the memory address where the first fraction lives. This is the memory address where the second fraction lives. This is the memory address where the third fraction lives. The new keyword went and found us these plots of land to build those three fractions. <laughs> And then it returned for us the, um, the pointer, the memory address, where we can go to find that fraction. All right, so when I say F1 dot display here, what this is actually doing is it is resolving F1 to its memory address then it is, well, let's just put it as numbers. It's doing that first. Then it follows the address to the actual fraction. That's our pointer. So we say that that memory address points to where the fraction lives in memory. Then it calls the display method on the actual fraction. Right. That makes sense? All right, so that is what's actually happening with those lines. The actual value that F1 holds is a memory address. How do we know that? Because of the keyword new. That's what the keyword new does. It returns a memory address. Okay. And remember, we experimented with this last class with the uh, double equal sign for strings, right? Where when I used the new keyword to build a string, it forced it to go find me new memory for that string, as opposed to creating strings ad hoc and just saying string s is equal to hello, string s2 is equal to hello. Those guys actually were both stored in local literal space for strings. So if you had two strings that had the same value, they shared the same memory address unless you forced the building of the string with the new keyword. Now what I'm telling you is, is that other than strings, you will always use the new keyword for building objects. The reason why you don't have to use the new keyword when building strings is because strings are used almost like primitives a high percentage of the time in Java. So it's more efficient for you to store them as literals and then use the dot equals method, for example, for comparing the contents of those strings, as opposed to the double equal sign, um, which is gonna look at the value of the variable. The value of the variable is, that is a memory address. It is a little bit backwards and kind of tough from a teaching perspective, because strings are our most common object, let's say, or right up there, you know, we use system a lot as well, but let's say strings are among our most common objects, <coughs> yet they're the one guy that behaves differently. Okay? Um, now, now I didn't talk about the two-string thing. That's something you previously knew? Okay. So since you let the cat out of the bag, it's okay. We were going to talk about it at some point anyways. Right now, and this is actually good because, I mean, one thing I do want to emphasize in this class is this class is not a repeat of the previous class. We're going at an accelerated rate. So I'm going to show you more stuff under the hood significantly more quickly. All right. So right now, when I print out F1, it's showing me crazy memory addresses. There's a little hidden thing here called 
two string that's actually getting called. All right, so let me just prove that to you real quick. Identical applet. All right, now let me explain why. We've previously looked at println in the documentation, have we not? We went through and saw that there's a println for ints and a println for chars and a println for all these, we're gonna look at it again, but um, uh, have I put in the notes the crazy word polymorphism? All right, so polymorphism is fancy word for saying there can be more than one method. I'm sure we've mentioned it last semester. Um, there can be more than one method with the same name, but a different number, number and or type of parameter. We've seen that before, right? That word at some point, I've thrown it up there. You guys should have memorized everything because remember everything that comes out is gold. It is pretty bad, but I rely on you pretty heavily to tell me what I've talked about and what I haven't talked about. I got plenty of stuff that we can just add on. So if we run out, of, we'll, we'll never run out of stuff to talk about. Um, but I'd rather talk about it twice. Okay, so we have this idea that we can have more than one method that has the identical name, but it might take a different either type of parameter or a different number of parameters, that type of thing. And the println method is a very good example of this, and I'm sure I showed this before. Um, let's see, system object Java, but we'll look at it again. All right, so here's the system object. The system object, so here we'll connect a couple of dots from what we talked about today. I mentioned that classes, and I'm actually gonna put it in the notes again too, just so we have it. A class, which is our construct for building objects, that's what a class is, has three members. We have fields, we have constructors, and we have methods. So these are variables associated with the class. These are initializer methods for building instances of the class. And you can have more than one constructor. Maybe you are able to build a fraction. Uh, actually, I'll, we'll show an example, but maybe you could build a fraction by giving it a numerator and a denominator. Maybe you can also build a fraction by giving it a string representation of a fraction and having that constructor split that in half and pull out the numerator and the denominator. Something like that. In fact, that would actually be a really, really good homework assignment. I agree. Um, and methods. <laughs> See, that's one of those questions that sounds intimidating. It's actually super easy. No, because I got to give you a hard assignment over the weekend. This is an easy, trivial assignment. I'll give you more than that for Thursday. Don't worry. All right, so methods. <laughs> what, what does not kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> All right, methods. These are abilities that instant well that i'm going to say for right now that instances of the object can accomplish or i'll just throw in here static versions of the object can do by themselves just kind of let that go for right now until i talk about the difference between um, static and non-static objects that would be something that's in the notes that will make more sense later on, but focus on the, this part of it. Okay, we've created three instances of fraction. One is stored inside of F1, another one is stored inside, well actually, the memory address of where F1 lives is stored inside of F1. F2, F3, we could say all those are, they point to instances, individual instances of fractions. Three different fractions three different objects. 
All right. So that's what a class is at the generic level. It's a collection of zero or more fields, a collection of zero or more constructors. If we do not provide a constructor, a constructor that takes no parameters will be provided for us. Might be a little bit of a waste of time at that point. We might start questioning why we created an object, but there are some examples where that might make sense. Okay, but we are not required to write our own constructor if we have nothing special to do. Um, if we don't, one will be provided for us that we'll never see, but it will support that syntax for equals new. So for right now, well, I'll just show you this as an example. If I go and try to create another fraction, fraction F4 is equal to new fraction like this, it's going to yell at me. All right. So it's going to say that there is no constructor that takes no parameters. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and just comment out these three guys. Okay. Still says there's no constructor that meets those parameters. But now I'm going to go in here. I'm just going to remove my constructor. And notice he's cool with it now. One was provided for us in the absence of us writing our own. It's one that does nothing, which may or may not make sense for us. Sometimes when we make an object, we might not necessarily have to initialize anything. It depends what that object's designed to do. But the reason one is produced for us automatically behind the scenes is so that this syntax works. That we can say new followed by the name of the constructor. Make sense? All right. So in this case, when we build fractions, we probably want to give it a numerator and denominator. We want there to be something that differentiates one fraction from another fraction. So we went ahead and we defined our own constructor. Now, the second we took responsibility for the constructor, the second we decided we write our own, Java then said, okay, I won't give you the default one then. Looks like you know what you're doing. Okay, so this default one doesn't exist in that case. And I would say very rarely are you gonna create your own object where you would not write your own constructor. It is possible that that could make sense in some worlds, but I would say it's fairly rare. But I just showed you the mechanic of how it would work if you chose not to. Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no question, Ms. Gretchen? He would find that if you kind of get higher, it'd be like a better stretch in the well, rotator I cuff. Didn't want you to well, I, I thought anyways. So you might as well get a reason though. You might as well get a good stretch out of it is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so going back to the documentation here, um, here's a field summary of what's in the system class. And again, forget about the fact that it has static in front of it. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a tiny punchline right now, but I'm not going to go into details with static yet. It's going to end up being one of those little mantras that we talk about, you know, that we say over and over again. So it's not an unimportant thing. It's just not important yet. So static means that there is only one of them. Leave it at that for right now. So we have this variable out. System dot out. Pretty common thing, right? So out <laughs> is a variable of type print stream. So I'll just go ahead and click on print stream, whatever that is, okay? It prints something over a output stream is what it does, but whatever, doesn't matter. Come down here. Here's our constructor summary for print streams. Notice there's a whole bunch of constructors. They're all named print stream, right? In Java, the rule is that constructors have the same name as... Um, uh, have the same name as the class itself. Whereas in Python, the constructors were always called underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Make sense? Okay. But we have a whole bunch of different ways of building print streams. 
We can build a print stream with a file. We can build one with a file and a, what's the CSN? Oh, and the character set. We can build one with an output stream, with an output stream and whether or not we want to auto flush that because if you're receiving stuff over like uh, internet socket connections, sometimes data will get like stuck uh, in there and you know, it's just like flushing the toilet. You know, you gotta get, you get, this, get the stuff out. Um, so lots of different ways that we can construct a print stream. For our use right now, we don't have to worry about that. At some point, we might use print streams. At some point, you will likely use print streams in Java. But we use the print stream that was given to us in system.out, which is a print stream that was built to print to system.out, the screen. Okay, so this guy was already built for us, so we can display stuff to the screen. What we use very often is a function called printlin. Sometimes we use print if we don't want to have it automatically hit enter at the end of the line. Now, as we come down here, I'll just go to the print lens. Here is a print lens. Here's another print lens. Here's another print lens. Here's another print lens. Yada, 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 yada. Polymorphism. More than one method with the same name, but a different, different number and or type of parameter. This one takes zero parameters. This guy just kicks it down the line. So if you ever are kind of building an output, with a bunch of prints and then you finally want to just jump it down the line you can just do a print limb with no parameters or you can do a print limb with a string that has nothing in it print limb with the empty string but that's calling a different version of print limb. so notice we have a print limb that does a boolean a char a char array double float int long these are the guys that are of interest to us right here so there is a print limb that works on strings that we're calling pretty often but then we have a print lin that works on an object. Now let's go back here and look at our code. System dot out dot print lin F2. What kind of animal is F2? Cat, dog, or object? That's an object. All right. <laughs> okay. So this would be the version of print lin that operates on objects. This would be the version of printlin that operates on ints. Make sense? Yeah. Two different calls to printlin. Go ahead. So there's a difference what, uh, what value you put in print? For, well, yeah. So in this case, I'm calling printlin and I'm passing it an int. In this case, I'm calling printlin and I'm passing it a object. I'm actually talking to two different versions of printlin here. So yeah, it's the inputs I give it. The inputs I give it lets Java know which printlin it should execute. So because I've given this guy down here an integer, an int, it's going to call the version of printlin here. So where's my guy? This right here. That knows how to deal with an int. The other one where I'm passing in an object, he's going to call my version of printlin that knows how to work with an object, okay? Now, what is an object? This is an important language lesson because it tells us, so in 470, when we write our own programming language and we implement object-orientedness in programming languages, we learn that a programming language that's object-oriented is built on top of an assumed structure that there must be a beginning. Okay, there's a, it's a, it's the Java creation story. All right, so, so there, there must have, there must be a beginning. So there already exists this thing called object. Maybe it's a lowercase o, maybe it's just obj in the language, whatever. But there is this thing called object. So this guy is the base class of all things that are objects in Java, and I'll just put in parentheses, in most object-oriented languages. Make sense? All right, so we have this thing that already exists in the, in the language. We didn't build it. The makers of Java built this guy. So they built this object. So this is the most generic representation of an object for a particular language. OK, 
Okay, so the makers of that language, they thought about, you know, the idea of a general object. So if we're in, in, in real life, if I hold something up and it's just like almost like a gelatinous whatever, okay, you really can't identify it as anything specific, but I say this is something, right? Anything that is something has some base properties, right? So maybe we think in, in, in real life that an object is, is something that is, is physical, something that you could pick up. Some things are pretty heavy. You pick up with enough strength, whatever, but, you know, they have a mass. They have a, you know, all sorts. We could identify some base attributes that all objects have, correct? But not all objects are identical. You know, a remote control performs a different task than my coffee cup. Clancy. <laughs> All right. Makes sense, but both of those are objects. Right? All right, so we have this baseline object that's in Java that says, this is what every single object is built on top of, is this idea. So inside that class, we did not have control over it. It was written for us. And if I go ahead and follow the yellow brick road here, and for this Printlin version that operates on objects. So really, we could read this as, okay, we have a Printlin for Booleans, for chars, for char arrays, doubles, floats, yada, 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 for strings. And then we could say, for everything else, we have a catch-all Printlin that will work on everything else that meets the requirements of an object, any kind of object. Make sense? So when we talk about objects, we have to think about the common collection of traits that all objects share. So we do have a constructor for an object, which takes nothing because it is effectively like an undefined thing, okay? We have some ability to like clone objects. This gives us a, a new copy of, of memory. So if I wanna have an object that is the same as the original object, but actually has a different memory address to kind of like preserve it, I can use clone for that, whatever. Forget about most of this stuff. There's all sorts of, you know, baseline things that an object has. But the important thing for us, the, the, the kicker of this lesson is this method right here. All objects have a method called toString that returns a string representation of an object. So among other things, all objects have a method called toString that returns a string representation of an object. The default output is a memory address as a string. We are guaranteed that every single object that we ever create or that already exists in the Java language no matter how complex that object is, we are 100% guaranteed that that object will have a two-string method. How do we know? Because every single object is built on top of the object base class. This is the beginning. And the object base class says all objects have a two-string that returns a string representation of that object. Make sense? Go ahead. So if you wanted to make that address into a string that we can see, you would take the two objects or or the uh, All, two string. Yeah. We would write our own version. Yeah. So let's actually show it. So so you're right. We would go into the code here and if we wanted this to work, right? Because we already proved here that what F1 is actually doing is he's calling the two the, what this print lin is doing is he's calling f ones dot two string because he knows that F1 does have a two string method because F1 is an object. But if we want that base thing to not really show stupid memory address, instead, we wanted to write our own, we could say public 
string to string and have this guy return that. This overrides the default two string method we inherited from the object class and allows us to do our own thing. Okay? So we now have a more local version of that two string method. So inside here, when we say f one string, what kind of animal will that boil down to? Cat, dog, or string? String. All right. So now we're actually calling a different version of Printlin. This is the version of Printlin that knows how to print a string. Right here, Printlin is taking in an object. So this version of Printlin is the one that knows how to print an object. And I'm telling you what that version of Printlin does is he takes the object and he calls that object's two string method. And we're going to prove it here because we're going to see for F2, it's no longer going to give us a crazy memory address. Now it's going to give us this better version of two string because we wrote a more local copy. Make sense? Okay, I'll just remind you of one other thing we talked about much earlier in the course in that all programs begin and end with main. Yeah. Notice I keep running the, dr the driver file. I'm making changes over here in Fraction, but this is the actual program that's driving my program. I happen to be using our Fraction, but this is my actual program. I'll go ahead and run this and we're gonna see that we get, that's our F2. That's our f1.2 string. And we can prove that this is working, okay, by saying, hey, by the way, I'm crazy, and I'm going to go ahead and just tack on my parents' version of two string. So super is how we refer to our parent. And our parents' version of two string here gives us crazy memory address. So there is one fourth followed by crazy memory address. There is one half followed by crazy memory address. So in this case, we're actually calling both versions of two string. Printlin is calling the most local version of two string. And the most local version of two string is the one we wrote, but we wrote that guy in terms of you know, here's our, hey, this makes sense stuff. And then we decided for no good reason other than, I don't know, maybe being a little bit uh, south of north to tack on whatever our parents' two-string returns. Now, that could be helpful in some situations. Maybe this one isn't that kind of situation. But sometimes you might have a method that your parent wrote or that we wrote, maybe if we're writing our own version of inheritance, we might have a method that's written in the parent that really does almost everything we want. But then we need to do something a little extra. And rather than writing that code twice, we might do the little extra and then go ahead and call upon our parent's version to do the default stuff that needs to happen as well. Okay, and we'll see some examples of that. All right, so questions on any of that stuff? Go ahead. Based on this example, it seems like the two different classes are working together with each other, it seems like. Between fraction and driver? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. We wrote this guy, this guy is like a blueprint. Like we ordered off of Amazon uh, kind of some instructions for how to make fractions. And then over here, this is real life where we're actually making some fractions. Okay? For our homework. Oh, <laughs> I want this. To work. I want there to be a version of our constructor that takes in a string 
and ultimately breaks it up into a numerator and, den and a denominator. So there will be a second constructor in here, public fraction string f fraction. And this guy should divide. So f is in the format of numerator slash denominator. So somehow using only what we have learned in class, that means you cannot use the split function or the string tokenizer or any of these other things that might be built into the language. Using only what we've done in class, divide the string and set the numerator and denominator. All right, and this is another example of polymorphism. Two different functions, two different constructors, same name, but this guy takes two integers, this guy takes one string. Go ahead. That's a true statement. Yeah, for, for right now, we can talk quite a bit about how packages work, but for right now, just put everything in the default package. One thing you might notice is that Eclipse even gives you a warning that we don't recommend you using use the default package. Until we really care about that, we just won't care about that. Just put everything in the default package. Go ahead. Um, just to make sure I understand this. Um, so basically, if we're inputting a string, we want to be able to, like, for example, if we want to have like a printout statement, we can say like the, the, the uh, numerator is this, the denominator is this. All the rest of this stuff should work. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. If I build a fraction using either of these constructors, the rest of the stuff should function. So ultimately, you need to get numerator and denominator equal to this piece and this piece as integers. Okay. Make sense? So we are building new strings and converting those strings into base 10 numbers. Got it? All right, and this is due on, uh, what day is today? Tuesday, this is due on Thursday. Don't forget to message me if you're going to come to see you launch. So I should get something like 15 or 16 messages in the next 10 minutes. All right. Also, student, faculty, staff, Bible study is today. God in grub. Go to the cafeteria, sign in, get your free lunch, take it down to the terrace room. Let me just get this uploading real quick.